Well, I, I actually lived in Oakland for a period of time, and I lived five blocks from that where that incident occurred. Um, that was my that was my BART stop. Uh, I'd be on that platform twice a day or so. Uh, let's see. I've read this one a number of times, but I feel like reading it again. Well, go ahead now. <laughs> uh, since it, we're doing some poems for the dead, <clears throat> um, I really I, I remember the day Marvin Gaye died. Um, and I was quite young. I didn't know who Marvin Gaye was. Some of you probably did. Uh, I didn't. Um, but uh, for reasons that are explained in the poem, it's a very vivid memory. And of course, I've come to to understand and appreciate Marvin Gaye and his music more in the years since. I think I was, well, well it's in the poem. Uh, it's called The Day Marvin Gaye Died. Every generation has its historical moments of collective grief and disbelief, moments we forever remember exactly where we were when. The deaths of Kennedy, King, Clemente, the space shuttle Challenger explosion, when the planes hit the towers on 9-11. Some of these things I was around for, some I was not. But I remember the day Marvin Gaye died. It was the day I saw my father cry. In 1984, I was halfway to manhood, living halfway between Motown and Michael Jackson's hometown. I knew nothing of Orwell's big brother, Reaganomics, Beirut, or the Contras, my world consisted of playing guns with my brothers, a meager allowance, and the Dallas Cowboys. I was nine years old, almost ten, that April Fool's Day. My father and I seated side by side on the burgundy brick pattern couch, living room awash in the electric blue-gray glow of the television, father and son sharing a can of Pepsi as fathers and sons are wont to do in the last remnants of a spring Sunday evening before it slips away into work and school. The talking head announces the shooting of a soul, singer, by his father in a furious fit on the day before his 45th birthday. My own father, barely 30, slumps back as if a bullet has struck him in the chest puts his working man's hands to his music lover's ears as if by blocking out the messenger's voice, he can make the message come undone. I watched my father watch the newscaster, waiting for the whole thing to be called a ruse, an April Fool's Day prank so we can laugh and say, that was a good one, they really had us fooled. But the punchline never comes. There is no rebuttal, and the newscaster is on to the next story, and my father's face is a pamplona of tears. In 1984, Marvin's sexual healing may have been my father's soundtrack, but Michael Jackson's Thriller was mine. <laughs> Side note, Thriller came out in December of 1982, so this will mark the 30th anniversary of Thriller. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> More than a decade would pass before I'd come to fully understand and appreciate Marvin's gift for music, his turbulent life, or my father's sense of loss that day, weeping for a man he never knew, but a soul whose troubles mirrored his own. So what's a boy to do when his father cries like a baby for the crimes of another son's father? He reaches out his nine-year-old arms, brushes away the saltwater bowls running down his father's face, wraps his small arm around his father's neck, neck and hugs him until. And should I someday be blessed with sons of my own, may they never be afraid to sing like Marvin, cry like their grandfather, and love as if eternally nine. <laughs> No, that's okay. Just no, because then...
Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I insist. He's not going to go again. I know. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to read this one. I uh, teach at UC Santa Barbara, Mini Lee.